All right, let's go ahead and go to James. We're in James chapter 1. We introduced the book last time we were together. And today we're going to go ahead and start in on the expositions, the actual text. How many of you have ever heard of Derby China? The, it's a type of uh, collectible uh, China. It's very collectible with those who love it. I mean, it, it, it's famous. Uh, it comes out of Derby, England. It's called Crown Derby. The China has that name. And the reason it's called uh, Crown Derby is due to the fact that it took a ro royal uh, script or a royal warrant in order for it to even be manufactured, to be uh, manufactured. But uh, there was a guy who valued this china highly and he collects it. And he's collected it for quite some time and he, he, he really prized it. And he had the opportunity to visit the factory where this china was actually being made. And so when he had that opportunity, uh, he took it and he went in here. And as he went in and he was watching uh, some of the, the production of this, because a lot of it is hand done, the artistry. And he was watching the artists applying various colored paints to the, the, the china itself. Uh, he noted that there was yellowish brown paint going on, uh, and he'd never seen that paint on any, on any that he had collected. He saw bluish black. He saw uh, what he called dirty red go on the dish, and uh, circling the edges was this black, really dark black paint that they were putting on and in his mind he's thinking boy that's going to be some ugly china uh, because it just wasn't very attractive the colors that they were putting on these these particular this particular pattern but when it was put into the fire uh, it, it, an amazing change transformation uh, was wrought by the fire when it emerged from the fire, the china had been formed into an exquisitely, exquisitely beautiful piece of china. The black had become bright gold. The blue and the red had become lustrous and bright. The fire itself, the fire transformed that piece. Now, to bridge it over, I want to say this. God in his wisdom... God in his wisdom allows some of his saints, and we're going to find out in reality, all of his saints, to enter the furnace of testing in order to produce a more Christ-like and a more mature person in Jesus Christ. In the opening segment of James, this is exactly what's asserted. This is what we see. So I want to read just verses 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you enter or encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What we learn here is this. If you have your notes, this will be your propositional statement there. Tr testings in the life of a believer prove to be blessings in disguise. Testings in the life of a believer prove to be blessings in disguise. Now you might ask, how can trials, which oftentimes uh, involve great suffering and pain, be considered blessings? How, how it just doesn't seem to equate. Uh, you go, go through trials and and you're suffering and you're, you're being uh, put to the test of your, the limits of your, your uh, perseverance. You're going through great pain. How can that be blessings? Well, as we look at this text here, James picks up on two points in regard to trials. And as we understand these, they'll help us understand that truth. How trials can prove to be blessings and do prove to be blessings. It's how we go through them ultimately, but we'll talk about that. So let's look first at the first point here. 
that he hits on, and that's one's attitude in the trial. It, it, it is critical how we go through the trial, whether that trial will ultimately prove to bear out to be a blessing in our life. Verse 2 states again, and I read, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. All too often, trials prompt uh, groanings. They prompt complaints. But this type of response, what we find in this text, it doesn't help in reaching Christian maturity. It only makes matters really ultimately worse. But on the other hand, James tells his readers, he tells those reading this, and that's critical that we'll, we'll touch on this in a moment. He tells his readers, but us by way of the Holy Spirit of God, speaking through his word, he says to count it all joy. He says to count it joy. The attitude of the one going through it, what we need to cultivate is an attitude of joy. This is the attitude we are to have in the midst of, of the trials. Remember the historical context, what we set forth last week when we looked at the introductory material. The, the, the readers of the, the well, I won't, I'm, it's a general epistle, so it's meant for all believers. Uh, it, it's not just all the word is meant for all, but even in uh, the historical context, it wasn't meant to be just specific. But he says in verse one there, he says to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And we looked at in Acts why they were dispersed. Why were they dispersed? Because of persecution. Persecution, Roman persecution against the Christian had broke out. And many, many believers died by the hands of Roman, of Rome. Nero, uh, he blamed the, the Christians. He burnt Rome and then turned it around and blamed all the Christians and persecuted and killed Christians wholesale. There was persecutions that, that, that had broke out and ultimately drove the Jews, the Jewish believers who had trusted Christ, had displaced them, driven them out, and they were scattered abroad. And that's who he's writing to. And then he tells them what? Right out of the gate, what's he tell them? Consider it all joy. You know what you're thinking? What I'm thinking, baloney. <laughs> Consider it all joy. I don't have my home. I've seen relatives. I've seen friends killed. I'm living in foreign places, doing the best I can to survive. And you tell me to count it all joy. Consider it all joy. So, the, so what he offers here, even in the historical context, it's the people who are going through it. They're going through it. And his expectation, God's expe expectation, is that the attitude of the believer is to sort it out and understand that there's joy here. There's joy to be had, to be realized, even in the midst of the trial, as severe as it might be. How do we respond? I question, how do we respond? A lot of times, woe is me. We'll go on a pity kick, may last a day, and God wakes us up to it. Or it may last a week, month, even a year, or more. Poor me. Why me? We get angry. Sometimes we get mad at God. What are you doing? Why in the world would you put this on me? We, we get frustrated. We grumble. We go around just with a countenance. And everybody's walking away from you like you're a rabid dog. Joy is not usually... The first thing that takes us in the midst of a trial. It's just, it just isn't initially the very first thing that comes to us. And I believe that's why the admonishment. That he makes a point to tell us that we have to what? Calculate it. Consider. Give it consideration the trial you're in. What is this? Why is it? 
And what's to be gained through it? That's what we're seeing here. There are two important truths here regarding the trial that we need to realize. The first one is this. Believers are going to go through trials. And by the way, it's plural. Because most of us wanted to say, I went through mine. <laughs> I wish it was that way. We put it in, we chalk it up, we're done with them. It doesn't work that way. But we're told, look what it says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, what? When you, not if you, but when you encounter trials. What's he saying? Every one of us are going to experience times of testing, trials in our life. And they are plural. It's not going to come, you're going to have one in your life. You're not. You know, when you're young, you sail along, usually. Um, today's youth, they're up against it because they're being taught and, and indoctrinated that everything that's wrong is right and everything that's right is wrong and there's confusion and all of this. But, but more and more, when my childhood, I was Peter Pan. I mean, I never did want to grow up. I could have stayed a child forever. Uh, I love my childhood. I love my childhood, but I remember when my first real test came. And it was the loss of someone dear to me, and it was my mother. I remember that day vividly, because it's the first time I ever experienced someone that I loved that deeply that I was gone. They were gone. But, you know, I had the Lord at that point. And what I found was, is that even through that loss, as great as that loss was, that with the Lord, it was, it, you can navigate it. You can navigate it. And you could have joy in the knowledge of the truths of God's word as they pertain to my mother. And as they pertain to my reality that she's not lost to me, she's just separated from me. And I'll see her again. My mama will be there. And I'm definitely going to go and see her pretty quick out of the gate. That's how dear she was to all of us. But we're going to go through them. And it's not just loss of a loved one. It could be uh, relationships that have gone bad. It could be economic woes. It could be persecution for your faith. They, they're varied. That's what we learned. Secondly, the trials that are going to come are varied or various or manifold. That's the way to translate that. They don't all look the same. They can be physical trials, mental trials. It could be a lot of different things, emotional testings that we go through. But we're going to go through those trials. We're going to face those trials and we are to face them with an attitude of joy. Again, that's tough to understand. But even understand this, this Greek term that's used here for the joy, it speaks of extreme joy. It's a strong term for joy. I don't know how you get there, but I think I've been there in some of my trials where I've been able to see God in it right out of the gate. You get, get the right perspective early on and you don't go in necessarily in the, the woe is me valley, you know, that, that part. You're able to, to, to sort it out early enough and you go through it and navigate it a little better. But trials, uh, perasmus in the, the Greek, uh, these trials are not to be viewed as tribulations. It's not tribulation. The word is testings. It's a testing. That's important that we understand that. That's, that's what the Greek word indicates, that these are tests. Everything we experience, manifold, various colors, various times of life, they look a lot different, but they're all testings for us, these these. Trials, and he says we're supposed to consider it all joy as we encounter these. These are tests. Well, tests are given 
for this reason to see if we will what? Pass. To see if we'll pass the test. Most tests aren't given to see if you'll flunk it. It's not the goal to flunk you or to flunk me. God's goal is never when trials enter my life that I come short and I fail it. Now, I have college professors where I, I question <laughs> their exams. They, they, they would word them in such a way, write them in such a way that I'm like, did I even study the same stuff that he's asking me? It was like they structured the test in order to fail me. Now, one professor did that. I got to share that uh, just real quick. This guy had a great, he has a great mind. He had a great mind. And he could write the questions in such a way using double negatives to where it didn't matter how you answered the question. And it was all true and false. And it didn't matter you answered it true or false. The way he worded it and the way you interpreted it, he could interpret that same question other. So every question, he could mark them wrong. He could just go through. Well, he did that. He did that to the entire class. And every person in the class got an F on it. And I, I, I'll never forget going down to the commons. In college, there's common areas where you go for coffee and there's, you, know, you sit with your fellow students and they are down there and they are just berating this professor. And I'm like, this has got to be a joke, you know, this, this test. Because I'm like, there's no way. And uh, he came in, and sure enough, it, you know, we, it was. It was all a joke that he pulled on the entire class. But he did a test, that test, so that you were going to fail it no matter what you did. God's not doing that to you. He's not doing that to me. He's not playing a joke on us. Trials are going to enter our lives. That's just the human experience. We're living under the curse. We're falling. And it's all over this world. And we're going to come up against times of testing in our lives. But God's heart is not that we fail the test. A true test is given in order to enhance growth, to show growth. To, as you come through that experience, you will grow. You will, you will become stronger, more mature in your faith. Part of making the grade, though, is determined by the attitude that one has as they go through the test. That's why he says, consider it, what? Joy. All joy. It's important to note that one isn't expected necessarily to be joyous for the trial. We, should, we're, we don't have to be happy that I'm sick. I have illness or I've experienced loss or I'm, I have, I've had to file bankruptcy or I, 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 I've had a relationship that I thought was going to last and, and it, it's shattered. We, we don't have joy over the actual trial, what it is, but we are to have joy, an attitude of joy as we encounter these various trials. Now, I'm going to ask you this question in, in making this point. Do you think, do you think that Christ was joyous at the prospect and the reality of the sufferings of the cross? Well, I say no, he wasn't happy about that at all because we have the whole agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, he, he, he was so stressed in, in a divine way, not as you and I experience stress, but in some way, yes, in, in the, on the human side. But what he was stressing was the separation that was going to occur between him and the Father as he became the sin bearer for us. And he, he said, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, that would have been his desire. But what did he say? Not my will, but thine. 
And then we find over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 about the Lord. It says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You see James there? The test was the cross. Not my will, but yours. And as he went to the cross, we find in Hebrews that joy was present even in that experience, as horrible as it was. It seems James is telling us, you and I, the test is not what we go through, but how we go through the trials. How we go through them. We need to understand when we go through trials with joy, there's a couple things that happen. The first one is this. We are acknowledging God's sovereignty. See, there isn't anything that happens as, as a child of God. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there isn't anything that it comes into your life but what it hasn't passed before the Lord. But I will tell you this, only that which is good and perfect comes from the Father above. So anything that he allows to come in, if it's bad and ugly, that's the result of the fall. That's the world we live in. But even those things do not happen, but what they have passed by him. He is in control. And that changes how I view the trial. When I recognize that he's allowed this to enter my life. That tells me that he has a purpose in it. I start doing what? I start considering. I start calculating what's going on here. And my attitude can change. And it will as we look at this next point here. But a second thing that happens when we go through these trials is we're testifying to our Lord and for God. This is a beautiful thing to see. I've seen it so many times in our church body. People going through physical trials, uh, horrible loss trials, uh, and yet going through them in a way with a proper attitude that Jesus shines. That people are caused to look at Jesus in the midst of it. Because they gotta get, they gotta figure out, they gotta deal with why, how can this person go through this the way they're going through this? And the reason is Jesus. They have the Lord. They're seeing more than just the trial. They're considering what God has in the trial. So those things are happening. Let's move on to the second point regarding these trials. What we learn from James is there are benefits in trials, advantages, if you will, in trials that we need to understand. We process this. This is how we're able to consider it all joy. Look at what he says in, the, in these following verses here. Knowing, verse 3, that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I'm going to read that one more time. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. So there are advantages, there are benefits. Listen, one can face trials with joy in the knowledge that there are rich benefits to be gained. So if God's, if I find myself in, in, a, in a horrible trial, the first thing I got to do is consider that I need to have a right attitude. And God says that there's a joy. And I believe we're talking that unshakable joy, not foolish giddiness. Oh, who's happy, like I said, with uh, a, a diagnosis of some kind of uh, illness or the loss of a loved one or whatever? No, 
but we're able to consider that I need to have a right attitude as I go through this. And God is doing something in my life. I'm going through what I'm going through for a reason. God is taking me from here and his goal is to take me here. In the trial. In the trial. So we can face them with the knowledge that there's things to be gained in going through this trial rightly. Trials that are rightly embraced, he says, produce endurance and understand this uh, it says knowing he says knowing that's how the first starts in three knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance you go through trials for the Lord you are you are enduring and producing in your life endurance and listen that's the one that is one quality you want to major in in your walk with Jesus. You want to endure. You've got to stay the course in the trial. It produces endurance. You go through that trial with the Lord, with the right attitude, and you are producing endurance. And they knew this because he said, knowing this, these people to whom James writes were familiar with trials and the prophet of endurance. Of going through them with the Lord and for the Lord, they knew that there were benefits to doing that. I love what the commentator in the Bible knowledge commentary uh, who wrote on the book of James, that commentator, uh, Blue, he said this, and it's very good. He said, there is no gain in endurance without some investment in trials. You say, I don't get that one at all. Well, go home and think on it. No, there is no gain. There's no gain in endurance without some investment in trials. What's he saying? You got to go through in trials to learn what endurance is. To learn what it is to stay the course as a believer and stay side by side with Jesus in the midst of the trial and come through the other side with the Lord. And the only way to get there and to experience that is go through the trial. We learn so much about God through walking through things in our life with him. By holding his hand and letting, more importantly, understanding he's holding my hand. He's got your hand. He's there. He, he's taking us through it. And endurance is being produced. Like gold, our faith is to stand in the test of fire and true faith like gold endures no matter how hot the fire of testing. And once we come through the other side, there is an exquisite peace produced. Like that Derby China. That's the goal. The benefit, the advantage, the fruit, he says, is endurance. Now listen, it goes on. It says, and endurance, when it is realized... It results in maturity. Look at verse 4. And I love this. Listen to what he says. He says, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Did you get that? And let endurance. So what's he saying? I personally am responsible for enduring so that endurance ultimately produces the end result of completeness and maturity in Christ. You say, well, pastor, why are you making a big deal about this? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because the problem more often than not is we bail out. 
We bail out in the process of endurance. We do not endure. We do not continue to consider it all joy. We, we jump off the band of the, not the bandwagon, we would jump off with the Lord and we enter into complaining. Woe is me, self-pity, somebody else's fault. You're the cause, whatever. The, we don't endure. We don't look at it and let God test me. And we bail out. And because of that, we never reach maturity. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, you know as many people as I do. We all have them in our lives. And we've seen a lot of people go through trials and not come through them looking any stronger for Jesus. Or the Lord. Why is that? Because in the process of endurance, they bailed out. And it didn't have its completed, its ultimate result, which is maturity in our life. That So we have, we're part of this. That's why he says, and let. You let this happen. Let the trial be what God intends it to be. And hold his hand, go through it with the Lord, considering it, weighing it out, looking at it for what it is that God is growing me. And when you do that, you come through it more mature, more perfected for the glory of God. That's what we're learning here. Do not bail out. The, the Christian experience, this happens for a reason. This it ultimately comes to pass if I go through it this way. And this is what's yet to be re realized. So the goal, the goal for us is completeness with nothing lacking. And he uses very trials to bring about that result in our lives. The reason we can say that trials in the life of a believer prove to be blessings in disguise is because one can rest assured. We can rest in the knowledge that God is at work in my life and that he is working to bring about Christian strength and maturity. He's bringing us to a place of completeness. So if God's taking you through trial, you hold strong on his hand. You stay true in your faith. You keep looking for Jesus to be glorified in your experience through what you're going through. Holding to that inner peace, that real joy. Letting the trial run its course. Enduring. And I'm going to tell you something. You come through that stronger for the glory of God. You are a more mature believer. You know that he is sufficient and he is able to see you through that valley in your life. And that's God's intent with all trials. And you're going to go through them. We all have been or have, but they're going to continue till he takes us home. I just pray that we go through them in such a way to where we glorify our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word today. I thank you for this message on trials, Lord. It's this is testings are tough. Well, Father, you know uh, how we uh, balk at them and can balk at them. But I do pray, Lord, that we would uh, truly consider what they are, how you would like us to, to go through them. And Lord, our, our prayer, my prayer, is that we would endure and, uh, and ultimately experience uh, real growth, real maturity in who we are as your children, as your people uh, coming, on, coming through on the other side. Uh, we want you to be glorified, Lord. That's our heart. Bless each one for being out this morning, Lord. Bless your word to our hearts. For those who can come back tonight and fellowship, Lord, uh, together, and we pray you bless that as well. But we look forward to what you have for us in the week out ahead of us. I pray, Lord, that uh, you give us that boldness as uh, your lights and salt in this world to seize the opportunities that you bring uh, to each one of us uh, to share the saving message across Christ with the lost and dying Lord. Bless each one for being out now. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.